the manager at Google. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, traditional custodians where I live in Victoria. I pay my respects to them and their cultures, and to elders past and present. My name's Rebecca Holmes. I'm a Strategy and Insights Manager at Google. That means I spend my days looking at all different types of consumer data and extracting insights to help our clients achieve their business goals. I love my job because data is my jam. And I'm so excited to be here with you today to share some brand new research on multiculturalism in Australia. Our hope is that by sharing this broadly within the industry, we can all gain a better understanding of these key audiences and come up with some ideas of how we can grow and diversify now and into the future. But before I get into the content, I want to ask you a quick question, looking for a quick show of hands. So please raise your hand if you were born outside of Australia. Keep those hands up. Now raise your hand if you had at least one parent born outside of Australia. Oof. Everyone have a quick look around. That is a lot of hands. A majority of us here, or our immediate families, are from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds. And I'm sure we all have our own personal experiences with multiculturalism in Australia. But as I said before, I'm an insights manager. Data is my jam. So what does the data say? Well, according to the ABS, the Australian population has been changing over the last 10 years. The first thing to know is that there are more people arriving in Australia. Record-breaking numbers, in fact. Last financial year, there were over 700,000 new arrivals into Australia. That was a 73% increase on the prior year. And it's also much higher than the 500,000 we were averaging before the pandemic. In fact, almost 30% of our population were born overseas. And it's not just that there's more people arriving in Australia, the countries of origins have changed as well. Since 2013, there's been a decrease in arrivals from the UK. And over that same time period, we've seen an increase in arrivals from countries like China, the Philippines, and India. And in the case of India, arrivals have tripled over the last decade. So who we are as a country is changing, and we're becoming more culturally and linguistically diverse. Now, I'm sure everyone in the room can relate to the need to continue to grow your business in light of challenging economic conditions, cost of living challenges, and declining linear TV reach. Well, if you're looking to grow your domestic audience base, those 700,000 new arrivals might be a good place to start. But to connect with these audiences, we need to do things a little bit differently. At Google, our clients have been asking us some questions about these audiences. How can we reach multicultural audiences more effectively? How can we communicate better with them? And how can we reach them where they're most engaged? Well, I hear questions like this and my eyes light up. We love a research challenge at Google, so we went looking for answers. And whilst there was some great insight out there, we couldn't really find anything to help us confidently answer these questions. So, took matters into our own hands and partnered with Kantar to undertake a brand new study on multiculturalism in Australia. Like I mentioned before, I'm so excited to be here with you today to share this for the first time publicly. We're about to learn a little bit more about these highly valuable audiences, their preferences, their needs, and how we can better communicate with them. So let me tell you a little bit about what we did. We did a quantitative and qualitative study and looked at two key audiences. The first we called newcomers. These are new arrivals to Australia who have migrated within the last five years and they're in the early stages of settling in. The second, culturally and linguistically diverse, or cold, these are first or second generation Australians who are from a culturally and linguistically diverse background. Either they or their parents were born overseas, but they're well and truly settled into life in Australia. We compared those two key focus groups with a third group we called acclimated Australians, who we treated as our control group. They're at least third generation Aussies. Now, what are some of the key characteristics of these two focus groups? Well, ABS data tells us that on average, migrants are highly educated, 
they have a younger median age than the broad Australian population. And our research tells us that 69% of them said that they would be willing to pay more for a high quality product. This was kind of surprising to us initially um, and really interesting. So we dug a little bit deeper to understand what was going on here. And this next bit is really surprising. The number one thing that newcomers care about when it comes to choosing brands is reputation. Now, I've been involved in many consumer studies over, over the years, and it's pretty much a given that price comes up as the number one thing people care about almost every single time you ask it. Especially in light of cost of living challenges that we've been facing at the moment, we definitely expect to see price as number one. And, true to form, that was the case for acclimated Australians, but not newcomers. For them, it's reputation that's number one. And at first we were really surprised by this, but actually when you think about it a little bit more, it makes perfect sense. Acclimated Aussies have an understanding of brand reputation that they've been building over the course of their lifetimes. We eat Tim Tams at Nans, we, sp we swim in Speedos, and we soldier on with Coldrill. But if you're a newcomer, how are you supposed to know any of that? How are you supposed to know that Burger King is kind of the same thing as Hungry Jack's? Or that Woolies is a supermarket, not a department store? Or that it's the same place people mean when they say Woolies? How are you supposed to know that, um, sorry, if I, asked, if I invited someone who just arrived to Australia to meet me at Bunnings for a snag on a Saturday Arvo, they probably have, wouldn't have any idea what I meant. And I'm sure any Brits or Americans in the room can recall the shock they felt the first time an Aussie started casually talking about thongs in front of them. <laughs> Newcomers are building new brand preferences from the ground up in a new country, and so they're leaning really heavily on reputation to help them make those brand decisions. So, as you'd expect, newcomers have a preference for brands they know and love from their home countries. But, a lot of the time, those brands aren't available in Australia. So they're having to do a lot of research to figure out what to choose. They're trying things, testing them out, experimenting, and this is a really key time to get in front of them with some great content and a really strong brand proposition to influence them and make sure that you are the brand chosen. But building, building reputation is not an easy feat, and we know that video is a really key part of doing that. Video is the best medium to deliver complex messaging, and so it's the best place to get in front of these groups as they're making these tough decisions. So we've learned a little bit about what multicult multicultural audiences care about. How about communicating them and reaching them a bit more effectively? Well, for publishers, it means that our content needs to be on point. Multicultural audiences have different preferences than acclimated Australians when it comes to what types of content they're looking for. And, as you'd expect, that often means content in their native language. One of my best friends is second generation Australian. Her parents are from Vietnam. And despite living here for over 30 years, her mum still loves to watch Vietnamese content that she finds on YouTube. Recently, my friend was helping her mum set up a new phone, and the only thing that her mum wanted help with was to make sure the YouTube app was downloaded. Not her contacts, forget about syncing photos of her grandchildren, she only wanted access to her Vietnamese shows. But it's not just content in their native language that they're after. Multicultural audiences are open to content across a variety of languages. They might watch the news from home, followed by an American movie, followed by some anime in Japanese, like this newcomer from the Philippines. Subtitles can be a really big value add on content because it helps increase the accessibility of your content with this group. And it's a key way that video can be used to connect really well with this audience. In fact, when we asked newcomers what their preferred language to watch content in was, 21% of them told us that they actually didn't mind as long as there were subtitles available. That's twice the number of acclimated Australians. But this isn't just a thing that we've been seeing on YouTube. Last year, Netflix reported that 30% of their viewing was from non-English channels, English um, titles rather. And 45% of viewing of English titles used subtitles or dubbing. SBS now has content available in 95 languages, which is frankly incredible. 
and almost half a million people tune in to watch the multilingual news every month. So we've learnt a little bit about what types of content these groups are looking for, but how about where to reach them? Well, newcomers in particular lean really heavily on online and digital platforms, and video is a key part of that. And much like they prefer brands that they're familiar with from home, they prefer platforms that they're familiar with as well. For example, YouTube reaches 80% of adult internet users in India, and it has a similar reach amongst newcomers in Australia. Channels like YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, WhatsApp, even Search are used consistently both before and after a newcomer arrives in Australia, and often even more after, as they're leaning on familiar channels to help them settle into life in Australia. Our research showed us that YouTube is rated highly amongst newcomers for having relevant and high quality content, indicating that there's a brand preference and reputation that's been built before their arrival in Australia. So high usage in countries of origin is relating to high usage here. What that means for those in the audiences is that when we think about these um, audiences, it's, there's more fragmentation than ever. Lucky us, right? Well, it's also an opportunity to consider how we're using our digital platforms specifically. Are they as accessible as they need to be? Are they discoverable in different languages? Do you have subtitles available? To reach and connect with these audiences, we need to make sure we're delivering them with solutions that solve what they want and need. So we've talked a little bit about what and where. How about why newcomers watch videos so much? Why do they love it? Well, we found that on YouTube, these, these audiences are more likely to tune in to learn something, to connect with their community, to catch up on news, and to watch reviews. So video is playing a key role in helping them settle into life in Australia while staying connected to communities overseas. And ads on video are a key part of this as well, where we saw 68% of newcomers tell us that they learned about brands on YouTube ads. I want to tell you a quick story about how HSBC tapped into this community, leveraging the power of video to drive a 31% increase in bank account applications. They had a clear objective to be known as the international bank of choice for migrants and expats. They knew they needed to bridge these audiences' lives in Australia with what they were seeing back home, and so did that by tapping into global moments that were happening locally. They put video at the heart of their media strategy and used it to develop an emotional connection with these audiences while educating and inspiring them. Not only did they see a 31% increase in bank account applications, they also saw international transfers increase, they had a significant increase in brand awareness, and are now their leader in their competitive set for brand attributes like international expertise. And this is just one example of the incremental growth available to you by tapping into these audiences using the power of video. So I'm almost out of time, and you've just digested a lot of information. Here's what I really want you to remember. No matter what business you're in, connecting with multicultural audiences is going to become increasingly more important. And it presents us with a unique opportunity to grow revenue, audience, and market share. In the short term, there's an opportunity to speak to newcomers as they're settling into life in Australia, understanding their preferences, and making these key brand decisions, using video as the key medium to connect with these consumers on an emotional level. And in the longer term, there's an opportunity to make sure our platforms are more accessible to multicultural Australians. Thinking about your digital channels and platforms specifically, how are we making sure that they're representative and accessible to these audiences? So I'll leave you with this final thought. Multiculturalism is mainstream in Australia, and there's a strong imperative for all of us in the industry to recognise this audience and tap into this, realise these short and long-term opportunities. Not only is this going to help us with incremental revenue and business growth, but it also helps us build on the rich tapestry of cult cultural diversity we all enjoy in this country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. No Thank you for your time. Um, we're going to move on to the next session. That was excellent. Thank You're going to be you. here for the day. Um, be very interested um, privately with your views whether the media industry has indeed done a good job in tapping into those uh, diverse uh, cultures and uh, very multicultural country here in uh, Australia.
So our next speaker, I think I might, I might uh, have his first slide. There we go. Um, whenever I speak to, to people here, they say, what, what do you want to hear from? They want international effectiveness experts and talk about creativity, all the stuff that we talked about in the morning session. And I was so jammy to manage to get this guy here. I just very quickly, are people familiar with this podcast? Yeah, okay, a couple of hoops and hollers, that's great. It's absolutely brilliant. John is an ex-CMO himself, and he interviews people very much like how Paul McIntyre and myself does, very frankly, very openly. And, uh, and this pod is absolutely brilliant, and he's managed to get all the global superstars on it. So I do recommend that you download it and check him out. We're really, really lucky to have him. As well as being the founder of this, this, uh, this CMO Uncensored podcast, he's also System One's chief content customer officer. He's flown in specifically just from Melbourne this morning, so he could be here. He arrived about half an hour ago. Ladies and gentlemen, massive round of applause for John Evans.